Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Um, we've had a slight summer recess, and Sarah and I were just discussing before how much we've missed um, these, these interviews and how much we buzz afterwards with ideas and thoughts and all kinds of things. And I'm really delighted that we're back on and we've got a few fascinating shows coming up over the next next month or two with some fascinating guests but none of the guests i guarantee are going to be more fascinating than our guest today the great susan Laybourne. and i say great and i really genuinely mean this i've known susan now for around about probably nearly 10 years and i am a huge admirer of susan's approach to most things in life she is an incredibly talented clairvoyant medium but she's very much in the same camp as I am of understanding exactly what this phenomenon is, what is taking place when people go into altered states of consciousness, seem to be able to divine the future and everything else as well. And Susan is very, very rational as well. She, We've had fascinating conversations about the implications of quantum mechanics and quantum physics for this. And a few years ago, um, Susan kindly invited my, myself and a friend who's been a guest on this program as well, Dr. Alan Roberts, to be involved in an event uh, called Scientists and uh, Mediums or Spiritualists at the Arthur Finlay College in Essex. And I think I've mentioned on various occasions that Susan taught me that I had vague clairvoyant skills when we were when I was there um, and maybe we'll touch upon that later and I think it was probably one of the most uncanny things that's ever happened to me but Susan is also um, a lady who is really pushing the envelope in terms of her own academic interests as well she's involved at the moment in doing her PhD um, in, in at the University of Wales and we'll be talking about this um, and her academic work because it very much runs in parallel with a lot of my own interest in terms of mediumships, in terms of oracles, in terms of the ancient Greeks, how the ancient Greeks and particularly the pre-Socratics used to see mediumship and mysticism. And Susan is very rapidly becoming a real expert in this area. So without further ado, Susan, welcome to the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. And as always, welcome Sarah to us as well. You know, it'd be really great to, uh, to have you involved. Um, but Susan, can you just give us a very brief background to your extraordinary life and tell us then what you're now doing? Oh my doing? goodness. The right, well, okay. Um... I mean, I started very young and, and I went to school uh, like two and a half days a week. And, and, I, and I studied at home uh, from the library. You know, I got library books on, on the occult and mysticism and the mind and psychology and anthropology and ancient history. And, and these were the areas that fascinated me. And I knew that I was learning things that would be valuable to me in the future. Uh, so, you know, while I while I wasn't at school, when I did go back to school, they, they would wonder, you know, how come you got you got a really good result in this exam, but you weren't here for any of these lessons. <laughs> so, um, uh, so of course, I was bullied because of that. And um, when I was nine, I realized that uh, that I wanted to become a professional psychic or clairvoyant or medium or something along those lines when I left school, because it, it was pointed out to me, if you're not here for all of the O levels, A levels, GCSEs and things like this, you know, you're going to be stacking shelves in a supermarket. So um, when I was nine, I set about, you know, kind of really strongly uh, uh, training myself so that when I left school at the age of 15, I could go straight into doing spiritual work, uh, which kind of worked straight away. You know, I mean, I was I was very fortunate. I was I was very fortunate to meet a Pakistani man in a bookshop. And he said to me, do you do all of this? And meaning reading, psychic work, etc. And I said, yes, I do. So we arranged the following week that I would meet him in a local cafe and I, and I would do his reading. And, and at the end of it, um, I just thought I'd done it for the experience and for the enjoyment of it. Uh, and and he, he opened his wallet and he gave me five pounds, which was a lot of money in those days. So uh, I, I have that man to be thankful for. But then he went away and he'd take my details and, and that was that. And then about two weeks later, um, he called me and he said, I've told my brother all about what you do and would you do his reading too? 
So um, this the, the brother, he had a, a, a factory unit in, in Hunslet in Leeds. Uh, so they said, oh, we, you can't come to our house because we live with our parents and they'd be really mortified if we bring a white person to the house. So especially a white woman. So we'll, we'll have to go to his place. So I went on the kind of cover of darkness to this man's factory. And I was 15. And, and, I, and I said to him, uh, I remember really strongly that the factory was going to burn down if they were, if, make sure you've got your appropriate insurance because this place is, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to burn down. I could see the, the place surrounded in flames. And of course he went, oh yeah, okay, whatever. And two weeks after that, the factory burnt down. Um, so my name went, round, went right round the Asian community in, uh, in, in Leeds uh, uh, as the person to go to. So I, I for a whole year, I only had uh, Muslim clients. So, and I had a uh, um, you know, huge success with, you know, with, with these wonderful people who were very open and very, so they kind of accepted me as a kind of, you know, uh, psychic guru, you know, person. And, and I, um, I mean, I even arranged weddings, I, you know, choosing, choosing brides. This person's coming from Pakistan. This, this person's in Liverpool. This person's in Canada. Who's going to be the best bride? Um, even things like what stone should I wear? I've got a problem with my finances. What, what, what stone should I wear? And rather than working it out astrologically, uh, I, I kind of tuned in to what they should wear, what, what gemstone they should wear uh, to, to move the, um, the, the stock energy to do with that planet. Um, yeah, so it, I was about a year before I saw my first white person. And she said to me, she said, I bet you're really popular at the spiritualist churches, aren't you? I said, the what? what, what what's, what's that? Is the one? And she said, yes. And she told me where to go in Leeds to the spiritualist church. So I went along and, you know, back in those days, they were all, you know, kind of older ladies with their, you know, the twin sets and the pearls and the you know, hand-knit cardigans. Uh, and they see me kind of bouncing in, you know, kind of, uh, oh, what's all this? And I remember the Sunday service and the woman on the platform, it was a, an old lady called uh, Mrs. Jeans. And, and she was to kind of demonstrate with a handkerchief and she said, yeah, girl, you can uh, And she came to me and she said, I see lights all around you. And I know that the spirit world are going to put you where they've put me. I thought, OK, right, fair enough. <laughs> so, uh, but everyone turned around and thought, well, who is this person? You know, who, who is this person who's come from nowhere? So, and after the demonstration was over, they had what they call an open circle, which are still very popular in spiritualist, spiritualist churches. And um, so the chairs get put round and there's a small amount of meditation, but basically just going into the silence. And then one by one, you know, those who feel that they've got something to say, they get up and they say, oh, I've got a lady with me and she, she's giving me the name Betty and she wants to talk about uh, her time in, in the munitions factory, or that kind of thing. And, and they say, oh, yes, that's my mum. So I thought, oh, that's what you do, is it? So, so on that same evening where I'd, not, I'd gone from the street to being in the spiritualist church, I thought, right, OK, so... Let's have a look and see what's what. And I went into that silence and I, I made a contact with somebody in the spirit world and I stood up and I went to, to the person. Well, they were, they were sitting like this, like they really shocked, like, uh, but it's correct. But this, this kid, it's a kid, you know, it's, it's like an overdue. Oh, it's this person. Uh, so I went every week for about, about six weeks, um, maybe a bit longer. And then the woman who ran the church, she said, I've had someone let me down for a booking. Would you do it? So she asked me to do the Sunday service. And that's all the prayers and the philosophy and the mediumship and all of it. And I said, yes, well, I shook throughout. I was shaking and I thought, thank God I won't have to do this ever again. Um, and then at the end of it, she said, I'm gonna put your name forward for Wakefield. And my heart sank. I thought, oh, my God, I'll have to do this again. So on, on all of the local churches, 
I mean, it was, I mean, I don't drive and I, ne I never have driven. And it was just such a trauma to, you know, kind of set off at sort of Sunday lunchtime to get to some out of the way place, um, you know, some back street of Yorkshire or Lancashire, um, you know, in, in those days. So I, I gave it up for about 14 years. And then um, the next time uh, I, I started going, this is much later, I'm, I'm working full time as a clairvoyant medium. So I was never allowed to sit in a circle because you're already working. You're taking the seat that somebody else could take, somebody who needs development. You don't need any development. Well, that's wrong because everyone, no matter who they are, they're on a continua continuation of development. Um, you know, even when, you know, you're on your, your deathbed, you're still not fully developed. So, you know, in those days, people have this idea of that is a fully developed medium or a fully developed psychic. And that was never the case. You know, people are never fully developed. There's always more to learn and more, always more practice to do. Um, so uh, the spirit world, they taught me from being very, very little about, you know, exercises uh, you know, how to understand messages, how to merge with the spirit world and things like this. Um, so I had things that they didn't have. And I taught circles, having never been in one, but being taught by spirits. Um, and that's how I kind of got, got on in, in my early time. But all throughout this, I had other interests, which were about, you know, kind of ancient religions, paganism, um, you know, ritual groups and things like this, which I also was part of. So there was always something about, about me in the spiritualist you know, groups and that say, oh, there's something about Susan. We're not quite sure what it is, but she's not quite like one of us. Um, and of course, that was all the, you know, the knowledge and the background and the science and the, and the understanding that didn't go with just a, just bare acceptance that these are, you know, you're dealing with discarnate minds. You know, you could be dealing with some other thing. You could be dealing with some, some aspect of, of self that's a projection, especially when people talked about, about guides. Um, you know, I was always a bit uncertain about what was going on with guides, even my own guides. Uh, and, and I very rarely refer to, any named entity that that works with me you know because that's an important thing to do is not to give it an identity and one thing that happens when you give a guide an identity is that you put it in a box and like so, so say you said oh I've got a guide and it's a Native American Indian you start to think about the things that happen to Native American Indians the sort of mentality they may have had the sort of lifestyle they may have had and you just start parrot fashion in every 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 film you've ever seen about you know cowboys and Indians and people with feathers in their in their headdresses, uh, and the intelligence that may have made contact with you to to try and inspire and teach you, it withdraws and you're left talking to yourself. It may be the higher aspect of yourself, but it's still yourself, and you need to own that. Uh, and when you're watching. Um, like a trans demonstration, you can see the point where the influence is withdrawn and the person's still speaking and they're speaking from their own intellect or their own higher consciousness. But you can see that the influence is gone and it's their own self that's taken over. And, and these things have always interested me um, and, and not to get too caught up in, in naming guides or, or um, talking about influences, who works with you, uh, I'm quite happy to think, well, it could be a part of my own higher self that not necessarily when you're giving evidence of I've got your mum here and she's telling me this, but more to do with you and your life and your future. Um, I, I feel that there's some, some higher aspect that um, uh, uh, David Ball may explain this about the, the implicate order and the explicate order. And the, an experiment that was done where he, he stirred glycerine into, into uh, ink into glycerine and, and the glycerine, dis, the, the ink disappeared into the glycerine. And so it was enfolded, packed tightly within those molecules. But then he stirred it the other way and it all unfolded and it all started to appear. And I think that we're the same, that we have packed 
tightly within our consciousness, within our molecules, our DNA, from time immemorial, from ancient times, before perhaps from the very beginnings of being human, these um, latent powers, that once you start to unfold them, they're all there. So it's not like, a, like being a bodybuilder and muscle building but being um, you know, aware that you have all of this, everyone has all of this. Um, and it, it's only certain people who choose to, to unfold it and to work with it and to make it useful for them and for others. Um, so that's part of my you know, kind of way of thinking about all of this. Well, of course, in many well, ways, course, I know, in many ways, I know you and I have discussed many times in the past about the role of the daemon and the idea of the eagle on the lower and the higher self. But I will just give an aside here because one, there are two things that uh, before we get on to your academic work that I really always want to talk about with you because I do find it extraordinary. It was the first time that you showed me that I that these skills are there. And it's one of one of those kind of times in your life when it makes you stop and think. And it was when it was the second event at, um, at the Arthur Finley College and you were giving a lecture and you were lecturing trainee mediums as to how to 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 connect. The, the sound's gone, tell me, the sound's gone. Hold on a second. Can you hear Sarah? Yeah, it's just gone back on now, Tony. Is am I back oh, okay. again? Yeah, okay. you're back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, where did I get to? Uh, you, you, all I heard was uh, you were you were working with trainee mediums, teaching them how to connect, oh, right. and then it went off. Okay. OK, we had similar problems yesterday when I was doing a live um, interview in America. Um, it seems the archons are really not happy with what I'm doing these days. Um, but going back, yeah, and you were, you were teaching the mediums and you, 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 you said to me, um, Tony, would you come up? I just want to test to see if you can do any of this, because, you know, I'm quite sceptical about these things. And that's why I respect you so much, because you respond to my scepticism in a very positive way. And you had me stand up in front of the audience and you turned around to me and you said, imagine that there's somebody standing next to you and that person is whispering in your ear information and just let your mind go blank and see what it says to you or see what visions come into your mind. And I'm standing there and suddenly I get this powerful hypnagogic image. And it's of a kitchen with all the cupboards off. And in the kitchen, there is a, a woman discussing very heated conversation with a young girl. And this image was so powerful, it came into my mind, it filled my visual field. And I just announced it and I said, I've just had a vision of this. And do you remember this woman stands up and she said, it's me. And she mm -hmm. said, I'm a school teacher. And she said that um, the reason um, I'm here today is that, um, or I, I had arranged for my kitchen to be renovated. And the last thing I saw in my kitchen was the kitchen with all the doors off the, off the kitchen units, like the carcasses. And then she said, and yesterday afternoon or the day before or whatever, she'd had one of her pupils come round and they were discussing what this young girl was gonna do, what A-levels she was gonna do. And they were having a heated argument about it. Now, to me, that was extraordinary because the image was completely non-standard. It was crazy. A kitchen with no doors on it. And I remember thinking to myself, that was, that challenged so many of my preconceptions in terms of how mediumship works, how the information field works. Was I drawing it up from the zero point field? Was I being telepathic in terms of picking up what this lady was thinking about? But it genuinely happened to me. So that was extraordinary. Mm. But the other thing, Susan, do you remember when you wrote to me a few years ago and you told me that tale? And I'm compromising here and I don't mean to. Um, but do you remember the tale you told me when you were in a lecture or something and some woman came over and said she'd read your book? Do you remember that? I, I, I'd been speaking at, at a conference in, in Blackpool and I would just done my my talk. And I sat down and then these two women, these two women uh, uh, who were seated in front of me, they turned around and they said, we've read your book uh, and uh, it's brilliant. 
and I said, no, the book's not published. Uh, it, I was supposed to write a book. I was I was invited to write write my autobiography for uh, Bantam Press, and then um, uh, strangely enough, the the agent decided that it wasn't enough money, <laughs> and, and I didn't know what uh, what an appropriate fee was in those days. So the uh, um, the thirteen thousand pounds advance being offered by Bantam was uh, uh, apparently not good enough for my agent. Uh, who who I had at the time, um, and he said, "Go away and write it, and then when it's done, come back to me." Uh, so um, when I was nearly done with it, I came back to him, and he said, "I'm no longer working in that field, and I don't know who to give you to. I don't know where to send you." So um, and that was the end of that. So the book's still, you know, in a state of final edit on my old computer. And as I've bought new computers, it's been moved as a file from this section to that. So, you know, it's been moved around. Um, but it's still there and never published. But these two ladies, they explained what was in my book. They said, oh, it's all about your travels and you talk about your, your time in, in, uh, in, in Borneo and you talk about uh, something about Africa. And, 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 and of course, all of those things are in my book. But it's not published and how these women would know about it, it because I've not been vocal whenever I'm writing a book or a project. Or, I, I'm always kind of all oh, keep it quiet. But, you know, there's there's always, you know, let's not scupper anything by telling anybody anything too soon. And um, so I, I'm always very furtive about about projects like that. Um, so it couldn't have leaked out on the grapevine that that Susan's writing a book. Or, or it's written or any any of those things um so an absolutely strange thing uh, and i've had many parallels like this where um you know i think i i once had a i think i once told you i had a phone call from from somebody uh, in the past and she rang me to say i'm meeting you for lunch yes and 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 she rang me on a number i didn't have back then to say i'm going to be a little bit late and I recognised her voice, and I said, "That that's 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 Farida. I I I know your voice." She said, "Yes, I, I'm in your class now," and I said, "No," and I, and again, I thought there's some other usurper, someone is, is is pretending to be me, and I thought, "No, it can't be." Um, but she was still insistent in some kind of Alice in Wonderland type scenario that she was still going to be late and that, you know, I should, you know, don't, don't go, you know, stay there in the, uh, in the cafe we'd arranged. So uh, I said, but I don't live in Leeds anymore. I live in Northampton now. So yes, 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 but I'll, I'll meet you. I'll be there, but I'm going to be a little bit late. And she was still insistent. And I thought, this is so crazy. And it's like the, the past linked back on itself and folded in on itself. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and weird things like that. Yeah, because when you told me those, you know, I was thinking, you know, in terms of my hypothesis, in terms of parallel running times and different timelines and everything else as well. And that's a classic example of it. Um, I'd like to bring Sarah in here. Sarah, have you got any observations thus far before we get into the really meaty academic stuff? Well, I suppose kind of bridging that gap um, how do you see your work comparing with like the ancient oracles and ancient divinatory skills? Because I, I always find it really interesting when someone researches things like that and they actually practice um, uh, or, you know, want to practice those arts in contemporary times. Because, um, you know, I've met a lot of people that study perhaps more of the magical texts of ancient cultures and things like that, but they don't practice magic or they don't try to include that in their life and I think it does give you a deeper appreciation for it and for me like oracles and divination are all about tapping into the patterns of life in the world and I believe that you can do that by you know uh, as you say this skill set is like locked up within us all the time anyway and, and naturally we're part of a living system so the same way that animals know where to go to breed or where to go to migrate. And they have this instinctive knowing. I think human beings have this instinctive feel about the future. And if they can identify patterns, then they can make good and accurate predictions about how things will play out in the future. 
the, the curious thing is um, the, the Chaldean oracles, which is my my research. Yeah, I was gonna, topic. That was so I'll jump in here because that was going to be my okay. first question. If you so, can so explain maybe I need what the Chaldean sort of, oracles are, and yeah, put them in perspective. Okay, well, they're, they're not predictive oracles; they are philosophical oracles. And this type of can you uh, say how Chaldeans were? So just to put it in background historical perspective. Well, this is a, again another misnomer. Uh, I, I'll maybe I'll explain about the oracles to start with and, and okay. why they're relevant. Because uh, going back to the second century, now this is the kind of traditional dating, but I've looked at this dating and it seems way off beam. And the reason why, I mean, they talk about. Uh, two men called Julian, both called Julian, a father and a son, Julian the Chaldean and Julian the Theogist. And the, the father and the son, they worked together. Um, the father was probably the entrancer. He, he placed the son into a receptive entranced state. And then, the, then the, the, the son spoke the oracles and then they were written down and then they were circulated. Uh, and one of the uh, ideas that has come forward is that we can date these things because uh, Julian the Theogist is thought to have served with Marcus Aurelius uh, in the battle against the Marcomanni uh, in uh, about 171, 172, around this sort of period. And it was a famous rain miracle that he is alleged to have performed. Now, looking at this material, this is one of the reasons that they've dated this material to this particular period. And it's, and it's all hinged on the rain miracle and, these, and this man being there. It wasn't there. This story appears several hundred years later in Christian sources. It doesn't, occur, it doesn't occur in pagan sources until we see it in the, uh, in the 11th century by Sellus, who, who was a Byzantine scholar, who was a Christian, and he copies something which has probably come from Proclus. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at, I mean, Proclus died in, in 485, so we're looking at the, the late 5th century. Uh, that would have been part of maybe a, a, a kind of, a mythological narrative like we have to talk about the beginning of a system uh give it a kind of a, a birthing and at this time there were all sorts of problems where they had you know kind of christians who were making um you know banning religious practices closing the temples you can't do this this oracular practice you can't venerate the ancient gods so uh, uh, pagans at that time, um, they weren't the kind of, when we imagine pagans, we imagine sort of, hey, nonny, nonny, flowers in our hair, you know, uh, that, we, that we see nowadays at the Glastonbury Festival or something. But uh, uh, that wasn't the sort of pagans that we're talking about. We're talking about really highly educated philosophers who, uh, even though we're, they're what we would call pagans they were neoplatonic pagans they were working from a system where everything reverted back to plato and what plato said everything had to had to match with something that plato had said or or it would be an upgrade of what plato had said or an addendum and this is an important factor because one of the early stories um, that, that we see is that the father invoked into the, the soul of the unborn son, uh, Julian, the, the soul of an archangel who would come into his soul and would uh, either teach him or the, angel would, the archangel would speak through him. But they also had this view that it was in touch with the soul of the long dead Plato. Um, now, it's my opinion that both these men are um, pseudepigraphal. They they did they probably didn't exist, or they existed as several people that had been kind of glued together to make a make a pseudepigraphal uh, um, originator of a system. And they're not actually Chaldean. If you look at the ba Babylonian material, yeah. Can you just uh, explain? Can you just explain here, Chaldean? When you use that term, you know, historically, who were the Chaldean? historically? 
we, we, we're talking about what we'd understand now as modern Babylon. Oh, well, not that, not not modern, but you know what I'm saying. Yes. In the in, in the ancient world, there would be people who had come from Mesopotamia, Babylonia, uh, from from those regions. Now, um, and there is a, a view that the these were probably um, created, channeled, I mean, whatever word you prefer to use. Uh, in and around the temple of Zeus Belos in Apamea. Uh, and again, I went looking at the evidence for this. And there is and where the is evidence, that located? Where is that temple? That, that, it, that's in Syria. Uh, oh. it, it's it, in ancient Syria, it's now in, in Turkey. Okay. Uh, uh, um, no, actually, sorry, I think it's still in Syria. Yeah. Uh, but um, the so a lot of the places that are in, in Roman Syria. They're, they covered a much wider landmass than they do now. So we have to understand that, that ancient Roman Syria and modern Syria are very, very different amounts of place. So we can look at Roman Syria covering from the Taurus Mountains the whole way through to touching into Judea. Uh, uh, so uh, quite a long, a long expanse of land. So... Um, and my research has, has found theurgy existing in um, the beginning of the second century. Now, the, the belief that theurgy was only developed by Julian the Chaldean and Julian the Theurgy. When, when, when you use the term theurgy, what do you mean exactly? What's I'll explain. The well, theurgy, uh, the, the breaking apart two, two Greek words, theos and ergon, and these two words mean god working or the work of the gods or working on yourself to become a god self-divinization so so these aspects are all related where certain practices which we could now understand as as uh, similar to transmediumship and this was first proposed by uh, by eric dodds in 1947 and Unfortunately, Eric Dodds, because he'd investigated spiritualism and he'd been a, a president of the Society of Psychical Research uh, in his kind of uh, uh, normal, you know, not outside his, outside of his academic life, he'd also had this huge interest in, in, in psychics and mediums. So he brought some of these ideas into his research, which are still roughly accepted. But unfortunately, what 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 Dodds didn't do is that in those oracles it talks about frenzy. So what we if he didn't if he'd have understood shamanism if it is if he'd studied shamanism and he'd gone to places such as um well such as Brazil or you know the, those sort of places where we're looking at deep trans states where people are in a state of, of frenzy or even things such as uh, in ancient India where we see um, the, the possession cults of, of the ancient gods, you would see that there's something that's not, because when you see trans mediums, they sit very still, they sit on a chair uh, and, they, and they're very, very focused and very centered. Um, the practices that have been, been described there's movement going on and there's frenzy being described. Not in all cases, but in some cases, there's references to frenzy. So obviously it can't be a, com a complete parallel to modern transmediums. There has to be some extra thing. Now, um, Iamblichus, he said that all theurgists work according to their own abilities. They work differently. And I've been able to trace so far um, three different sorts of theurgy. One that goes back to probably about the beginning of the second century, if not earlier, into the first century, or even you know the uh, you know the last century of the you know kind of before the before the common era, which is very shamanic. And that that region we're looking at uh, Jerash in modern Jordan. Where Nicomachus. I'm, I'm, go, I'm, go, I'm going there in November. So this is. Are you? Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Nicomachus of Gerasa, which is Jordan, uh, 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 Gerash, he talked about people imitating bird noises, clocking, making all sorts of extreme motions, and but also working with the 
uh, the, the sort of the, the sound of the cosmos that, that Pythagoras would have, would have referred to. Now, that's a different method when um, later on we see, uh, well, we've got Porphyry of Tyre who introduces the Chaldean oracles to Neoplatonists. And one of the first people he introduces it to is Iamblichus. Now, Iamblichus, he has a method where his theurgy is self-directed. He doesn't need an invoker to get himself into the altered state, mm. which sort of parallels many modern, modern uh, transmediumship practices, that the spirit overshadows the person and takes them into that state. Uh, whereas Porphyry, is the, the oracles that he uses that have now been understood to have probably come from uh, uh, Western Asia Minor, such as uh, the, the bottom part of Turkey, uh, uh, Caria, and um, you know all those sort of regions. That um, that is talking about practices where there is there seems to be a third person where you've got an invoker, you've got the person who is the medium and a person who is maybe the scribe writing it all down. Whereas in the Amplicus' theurgy, it seems to be self, self done. It, there isn't another person who was putting put him in that state. Now, Iamblichus was definitely a, a practitioner. We know that from the, from the works he's written, his, particularly his works on the mysteries, because um, Porphyry didn't understand a lot of what he, he was, what he was seeing in theurgy. And he went to his uh, younger uh, student, um, Iamblichus, and said, what's all this about? Because I don't understand it. Now, Porphyry was a bit stuck up and a bit up himself, and he didn't want to admit that he didn't know. So, so he, he kind of, he, he makes it this huge argument, and he's so pompous about it that Iamblichus has to get involved in this huge debate, this huge book, uh, explaining all the intricacies of theurgy and how it's done. Um, now, this even though Iamblichus wrote a commentary on the Chaldean oracles, uh, as did Porphyry, and then also later Proclus did, all of these things because of Christianity, they've been burnt and torn apart. And we've got fragments left of what the, what the oracles are actually saying. And this is the problem because they are fragmentary. The, the, you're kind of thinking, and a lot of scholars, they look at without the background in magic or mysticism or mediumship, they look at it and they go, what the heck is going on? And they gloss over it, trying to get to the, to the philosophy because there's a huge amount of philosophy. And one of the things that I, that I had to do was I, uh, I photocopied all of the fragments uh, from uh, the, the, the current scholarly book uh, of the oracles. And then I cut them up and broke them into three different sections. One where there is obviously Gnostic mythology that's been discussed. Another where there's middle platonic philosophy that's been discussed. And another where there, where there are theurgical instructions being given. Some of the instructions relate to ascent practices where you uh, basically you, you're coming out of your body and you are kind of being risen by the rays of the, the you know of, of the father who are who are like fiery rays it could be the rays of the sun or but you, you're kind of lifted up your soul's lifted up by these rays um so there's there's quite a lot of uh differences in theurgy now, and the main goddess, who is the, the revealer of the oracles, was always believed to be Hecate uh, or Hecate. Uh, and and she, she had moved from the sort of underworld goddess, the, the sort of chthonic, uh, you know, ruler of daimons uh, in, this, in this other world, in the underworld, uh, ruler of the dead. Uh, where well, you go and meet her at a crossroads and you do dark doings and things, you know, but, but Hecate, she was a hugely popular goddess in this period throughout the ancient 
period, you know. But what happened in the Chaldean oracles? They made her into the into the uh, Platonic version of the cosmic soul or the world soul. Now, looking at what Plotinus had to say about the world soul or the cosmic soul, it's not Hecate to Plotinus; it's Aphrodite. And this is a curious thing. And you're thinking, okay, well, this is a discrepancy here. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hecate becomes the cosmic soul. And her aspects seem to be in several parts. So we see the term Heimagmene, which is destiny or fate. And we also see the, the word physis, which is uh, nature. Uh, and psyche, which is uh, psyche, the soul, the soul. So all these different aspects relate to Hecate's different, different jobs, different functions in these oracles. So we have to imagine that we're not dealing with a classical goddess or a classical titaness. We're dealing with something other where um, it refers to down the back of the goddess, the whole of nature lies unfurled, you know, and I've, I'm paraphrasing that, but the whole of nature is unfurled. And one of the things that the, uh, the theorists were advised against, warned against, is whatever you do, do not get embroiled in nature. Do not get trapped in nature because it will, it will take you into a realm of evil. It will take you into a dark realm and you will be trapped by, by cheating, mischievous diamonds who will tell you the wrong stuff. This is very Gnostic, isn't it? Gnostic. It's very Gnostic. When you get to the, the nitty gritty and you start unpeeling it all, we see this uh, and, and we see parallels with the Chaldean oracles with the work of Numenius of Apamea. And Numenius' uh, uh, work, again, he has this understanding of two, two souls, one good and one evil. And the, the two are kind of, they're there with you all the time, you know, but there's this idea of the, the good world soul and the evil world, world soul. And we see um, the, the higher aspect of Hecate as the, the cosmic, uh, cosmic world soul uh, that is transcendent and forms part of a triad between the, uh, the father, which is ineffable it's unspeakable beyond experience it has no shape no form it, it, and it is beyond description and then we have a demiurge character that's referred to as the paternal noose or the paternal intellect and between these two we have the cosmic soul uh, who is represented as a female power Hecate and she has clear parallels with the Gnostic Babylon Mm. The Sethian Gnostic Bible or, or, or Sophia. Um, and strangely enough, there, there are a lot of. This is very interesting. In... Just very quickly, just to jump. It's very okay. interesting. I have a whole section on Barbalo in my new book. So it's right, quite, okay. Quite interesting. okay. Because we, we, we can see that, the, that, that there is this idea of, um, you know, having done something wrong, you know, and, uh, and, and that there's a, there's a punishment or there's a fall and the fall of the soul or the fall of mankind. And it's certainly in the Gnostic teachings. Well, in Marcinese, which, which is, uh, is a, uh, thought to be a, a Syrian work, um, Marcinese makes uh, Babylon become male. Uh, whereas the earlier uh, kind of Elogenes and Zostrianos and I mean, Palfrey wrote huge, huge tracks on, on these texts under the you know, kind of instruction of Plotinus. Go along to these Gnostic meetings, find out what dirt you can find out about these weirdos. Come back to me and then I can talk about them in my talks and then you can go here, here, how, <laughs> how, how, how at. Uh, so. Um, between Porphyry and uh, a fellow student of Plotinus, uh, Emilius, they both wrote these incredible works of, of refutation of, of the Gnostics, which um, Plotinus had got a real problem with. Uh, because they were in his school, you know, that all these things were going on in his school. And Plotinus wasn't into all of this sort of wacky mysticism, rituals and things. He was very much a contemplative. It was definitely a mystic. Um, and, you know, I've, I've given a talk in the past where I've compared 
uh, the experiences of Plotinus. So things such as the, the kind of ecstatic epilepsy that you get with Dostoevsky syndrome, mm. uh, that there is, a, there is a parallel between what he's experiencing and what someone like Dostoevsky was experiencing. And, and epileptics who have this form of, of, uh, um, of condition. So, uh, but certainly uh, uh, Plotinus was this incredible thinker, but he had he had very strict views on on what he believed and what he what he would allow. Um, and there is references in the life of Plotinus that Porphyry writes, and he, he talks about Amelius going along to moonlit ceremonies where there's all sorts of strange rituals. That seems to me like an like a, an early form of theurgy that. Amelius is at least getting interested in or going along to. So we see these, these practices going on in Rome. We see them going on in uh, the Near East. And most of these things are coming out of the Near East. Um, Iamblichus, you know, he was a, a native Syrian. So this idea of the native gods uh, all around um, the areas that he lived, because he also lived in Apamea for a time, and he also believes, believes that he also taught in Daphne, which is near Antioch. It's a suburb of, of, of Antioch. So they, we have practices going on at this same period. But you've got this barbaric language that's being spoken by these desert people, nomadic people who are moving through it, through the region. And um, um, uh, it's believed that uh, St. Jerome, when he, he retired, he moved to this region and he wrote about the awful barbaric language that the average person spoke, which he had to, he had to understand just to go and buy shopping. So it, it wouldn't have been unusual to hear what they refer to as the nomina barbara or the, or the foreign names. And this is one thing that is in the Chaldean Oracles on uh, fragment 150, where it talks about whatever you do, do not change the barbaric names, do not change the, the foreign names. Uh, and, and this appears in many texts. It appears in, in the Hermetica, for example. Whatever you do, don't change the names of uh, uh, because we have letter strings, we had vowel strings, we had things that sounded like animals barking. There's one theurgic rite that is in, uh, well, not one, there are many, that relate to Hecate in the Greek magical papyri, where it refers to, uh, and it, it actually writes it out, but when you say it, or when you do it quickly, it sounds like a dog barking. Mm. And it sounds like that. Uh, there's also references to bird calls and, and replicating the sound of birds. So this sounds very shamanic to me, that there's some you know, shamanic aspect that's involved. And we also see the similar, a similar thing of what's been referred to as nonsense language or glossolalia. Even in Jewish mystical sources, where they say, oh, it's nonsense language, these words don't mean anything, but they've become incorporated into the text and they've become invocations in their own right. So, uh, um, one way of looking at it is that if these things have got an Egyptian element, because there's certainly in the Amblichus's understanding of theurgy, he incorporated Egyptian wisdom into Chaldean wisdom and glued them both together to make something uh, uh, workable. And of course, the letters in Egyptian hieroglyphs, they are representative of images. So the image, which would be called in the, in the Chaldean oracles, the suntimata or the token uh, or the symbola, uh, they would represent maybe hieroglyphic ideas that do have a, a verbal structure. So when you see a certain thing, like you see an image of a bird or you see an image of a lion, that you say the, the phrase, the thing that is the word. Um, because at this time, because of Roman influence and things, and then later Christian influence, these things are starting to become less and less known. Um, so we see comparisons in Gnostic sources, the Hermetica to some extent, 
um, the uh, Mithras liturgy, which appears in the Greek magical papyri, this idea of ascending and um, basically astral projection. Now, these ideas are very ancient and we can see them in the Book of Enoch, this idea of being taken up into another world and shown around. And, um, and they also go back to Mesopotamian stories of Emedoranki, uh, 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 who was going back to about you know third millennium uh, um, BCE? You know we're going back a long way for these these stories of being shown the uh, the mysteries of the universe, and you ascend to a high to a high place, and whether it's an angel or uh, an aspect of the the highest god, they they tell you all this amazing stuff that you're then going to go back home. You 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 know, go back to Earth. And then you're going to explain to, you know, the Oipaloi what you've just experienced and what's happened and what you've been given in the in, in the in the other world and and hopefully educate the people. And these are uh, in the earliest sources, you know, such as the Medirankhi and, and uh, Edapa, they, these refer to ideas of divination, how divination systems were, were brought about through, you know, looking into water, through looking into fire. You know, these things were brought about through, through these sort of practices after someone had uh, ascended, been in an altered state. Now, whether they've been unconscious for a few days, whether they've been in a, a coma and then they've come round and they've got, oh, wow, I have this incredible experience. That's one possibility. But... Um, when we get to the sort of Christian period, or let's say just before the Christian period, people are starting to think, well, I don't want to be the one who's chosen, it is you. You know, you're going to be the one, the chosen one of God, that I'm going to help ascend and teach you cold stuff. Um, people wanted to learn how to do it themselves. And people were going about learning these practices to, so that they could ascend. And uh, the Chaldean Oracles was the primary textbook of these ideas. They, they contained both the information that was received in the altered state, but also information about how you get into the other world, how you do it. Um, and there are several practices that are there it talks about uh, uh, when you see a fiery form and you see that and you listen to the voice of the fire and things like that now i've looked at i've looked at this in relation to desert people in in palmyra because we have um clear parallels that the genie or the jinn or, or, or the genea of the Palmyrian people, the desert people from that region, they fed into the beliefs about jinn that the Arabs of those, you know, modern Muslims would have in those regions. And the idea that the uh, Jinnaya and the Daimon or the Daimon would be a comparable entity in these cultures. It's only when we go to places like Rome where you know, this is a very different thing. And the genie or the genius it is a very cultured entity that can teach you things. Um, th there's a lot of cultural differences. I mean, my own experience of experiencing jinns in the Emirates to experiencing jinns in Bradford and experiencing jinns in Malaysia, we're talking about three different sorts of entities. And the same would have been true in the ancient world when we move from location to location and the stories of people who were, you know, in some cases, desert nomads who settled in and around Palmyra. Now, there was a Roman road, a very active Roman road between Palmyra and Apamea. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a fiddle, but not, not that much of a, a stretch. So we've got to look at trade routes and people coming and going between locations, sharing stories and experiences. Um, these are all really significant factors when we look at the development of these oracles. Are they as old as, uh, as they're making out? And do it, does it go back to these, these two men, the Giuliani? Does it go back to them? Or how, are they a composite of holy men and practitioners from various regions 
who would have been working in this field because no matter who they were, they knew their middle Platonism extremely well. And this is an important thing when we talk about mediums or trans mediums, that when they start off, they always start off from a point of knowledge and then there's a divergence. So they may start with something that either they've read or it may be that they've read it 10 years ago and they're just bringing it back into their consciousness. And then at that point, and then at some point, it will verge off. And, and the medium, you know, in their sort of half conscious state, will be thinking, my God, I don't know this. What's this? And they do think that because when people say that they're completely zonked out and they experience nothing and they're in a black void, that's very rare. So um, that is uh, uh, something of interest that because it's it's all about Neoplaton, no, not Neoplaton, middle Platonism, Neopythagoreanism, it's talking about those sort of practices. It's also referring to the ancient cults of certain, certain gods, um, but it's not laid out clearly that this is particularly from this region or this, that region. There's no locations given it all happens on inner time so um you know often with with oracles it would say you know something like um you know a great power of salamis blah blah you know and it will it refer to places um these oracles don't refer to any sort of place they just refer to states of consciousness and and, and platonic ideas about the about the triad um and also what Proclus made into was sets of triads that makes it more complicated. So, um, so the, these things are, are, are very involved, but at the root of it, you have these uh, very uh, practical spiritual experiences of people having mystical states, things that could be, because in the early days of theurgy, when it talks about what uh, Julian the theurgist did, it just looks like normal street magic, changing the weather, helping someone heal, you know, not anything wacko. Even in the time of Iamblichus, where it talks about the theurgy that he can do, apart from his students who say, oh, he pulled out two boys out of the, uh, the Gadara pool, <laughs> these spirit boys, uh, and he could levitate. Now, that is one, one thing, but of the magic, it, it's, and, and uh, St. Augustine, looking at Porphyry's work, he can't understand, well, what's the difference between this theurgy stuff and street magic? What's the difference between going down the marketplace and paying someone a few, you know, a few drachmas and, and um, having some magic done, you know, some, some healing done or something like this? And, and still they couldn't understand the differences. And I started looking at it and I'm thinking, well, there's this bit here, which is clearly just basic magic. But it seems to be on a spectrum where you start with basic magic and then you emerge at the other end of the spectrum where you where we're looking at self divinization. So whatever you know, whatever needs doing, it's just a thought away. Uh, so we have these aspects of this spectrum rather than well, it's this and it's this and it's that and it's that, but it's that but not this. Um, it, all of those things are connected. It's like a a, a continuum. That was the most extraordinary exposition I think I've ever heard. That was absolutely incredible. The amount of information you've just imparted is just mind-blowing. And I know that with Sarah's interests in hieroglyphs and everything else as well, I know that probably you're quite keen to come in here now, Sarah, before we move on. Well, one thing I've always wondered, especially with Hecate, is it doesn't get mentioned very much, but the Egyptian word for magic is Heka. And this concept of a triad is a massive part of Egyptian religious systems as well. There's always a, a father, uh, a mother, and then uh, a divine child. Um, but yeah, as I totally um, you know, agree with Anthony there, that was amazing. I've made loads of notes, but they're all quite um, illegible. So I have to just draw out what I can from those but so interesting and I think that the whole thing of, of, of this this aspect of, of Platonism where it's all about you know this because as we move forward in to, later in time with people such as Proclus and Damascus that the um 
the ineffable becomes even more remote, even to the point of, well, what's the point of it being there? You know, do we even need a, 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 a supernal father that's overseeing all of this? Because obviously he couldn't care less. And that we're sort of left to our own devices with the sort of demiurge character, which is the pater paternal intellect or noose. Um, and, and then, you know, this sort of uh, female entity, the cosmic soul, because it goes back to very early mythology, really, where you've got the demiurge who makes people and Hecate or the cosmic soul who sticks your soul in you, you know, and everything that exists has been, you know, kind of put together by, by this, you know, they're not even mother, father, but they're sort of seen as once feminine, once clearly masculine, and, and between your body and your soul, you need both of these entities to, to create a human being, but also all things that live. Um, so, you know, this is a, a very significant way of looking at the universe in the form of triads. Uh, and it goes back uh, historically into Plato's work, the Parmenides. Now, uh, that he starts to explain uh, uh, about these, you know, the hypotheses that, that, that are there in the Parmenides and, take, and takes it apart. Um, so we're looking mostly at the Parmenides for influences, but we also see the Timaeus, we see Phaedrus, we, uh, we see uh, the Theotetus, because one of the significant things that Socrates says in the Theotetus is, is that whatever you do in, whatever you do, you must seek to become as much like God as you possibly can. Um, which means basically whatever spiritual practice that you can adopt to make yourself divine, do that, use that, whatever is to your, whatever is to your hand, you use that material. Um, so going back to Socrates and even before the idea of the, the helping daimon, uh, they've experienced different understandings of the daimon or the daimonic force over many, many hundred years, many hundreds of years in ancient Greece and Greek speaking lands, where at the beginning you could walk into a room and you think, oh, it feels a bit frosty in here, like there's been an argument. Now that in itself was a diamond. It was a sort of diamond of arguments. And, it, and you walk into a, uh, into a cathedral and you go, oh, there's this feeling of, uh, of holiness and sanctity here. And that in itself would be a diamond. And, and then later it started to become like a companion that was your, you know, your friend. And they, they also have this other understanding that's not the daimon, but the paradros. And the paradros is, is the, again, a, the companion, but the companion is going to help you ascend. Um, I was going to help you on your, your higher journey, your higher spiritual path. So... Uh, all of these uh, developments of the daimon have occurred since, uh, since far antiquity. And then by the time we get to late antiquity in the Christian period, um, I mean, for example, Augustine, it can do no other than to see the, the cosmic soul as the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, it has to link those two things. It has to link the two together because he can't understand what this cosmic soul thing is that uh, it sits between, but it's female, but we don't know. Porphyry doesn't mention Hecate in that context. Uh, he, uh, he's referring to this, this cosmic, cosmic being. Um, but it's all very confusing to, to Christian commentators that, who, are, who are looking at this material and finding, you know, kind of great confusion in it. And one of the curious things is that uh, Neoplatonists, in the face of encroaching Christianity, thought this is only, you know, this is only suitable for idiots and children, you know, that this, this, this philosophy is supposed to high level philosophy that is, that is meant to be given in the patristic schools and people talking about understanding the gospels and things that it is really, really, really basic. It's really poor, you know, so, um, and in, um, you know, some ideas of, like St. Paul, what he, one, one of his things that he would do, he would go to a town or a city and he would set up and he'd go to the, he'd go to the local synagogue and he'd sort of, you know, kind of hang out his wares. 
Um, but when he went to Athens, he was given the opportunity to speak at the Areopagus, uh, where all of the great philosophers uh, uh, that had spoken over time, they were allowed to speak. And uh, he, he got out of town soon after because really, being you know, he's not written in the text. This is just my understanding of it. But after he was challenged by these really, really high level platonic minds and, and Aristotelian minds and stoic minds, people coming together to ask, well, what about this and what about that? He couldn't answer their questions sufficiently. So he got out of dodge fairly quickly. Um, can I just stop you though? I'm quite interested in this. So although obviously the the, 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 the Paul's letters and everything is the only thing, the only source we have of what Paul did. So were there alternative um, documentation about Paul, like, for instance, the time he was in Athens that showed that he was really caught out because he, he wasn't as good as he made himself out to be? I imagine he was caught out. That's just me guessing, you okay. know, but I think that, um, you know, when he went somewhere, if he wasn't, you know, kind of immediately treated, because he was, a, I mean, I didn't like, I, I've taught on St. Paul. <laughs> I, I taught a course at Wilson College at Oxford uh, with uh, on uh, the, uh, um, uh, what, 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 what was it? Um, one of one of Paul's letters, anyway. My mind's gone for, at the moment. But looking at his material, and he doesn't like baptizing anybody. You know, it's, it leaves baptizing baptizing all up to somebody else. You know, like go and see so and so, or go and see this person. Um, and he's, he's big into just trust. Don't don't ask. Just trust. Um, just trust it's correct. Just trust it's right. Trust in the Lord. Um, so all of the philosophical questions that are, that are, that people are used to asking that are from this kind of Hellenistic background, that are Hellenistic pagans, and they're used to uh, asking probing questions about the nature of the universe and the nature of philosophy and the nature of you know what do you mean? It, uh, because in one of the one of his pieces, he said, "I knew a man who 14 years ago ascended to the third level of heaven." And he's talking about himself, but he's, he's kind of made it out that it's another person in case it's not, you know, it's like, well, maybe in case you don't like it, you know. Um, so in this period, uh, they, the people who was, he was speaking to must have, must have understood this idea of ascending to a higher level or ascending to a heavenly state or, or a, a, um, you know, kind of you know, up into the universe or something. They must have understood this uh, to be able to trot it out and say, I once knew a man who 14 years ago, in da, da, da. Um, so all of these ideas of where St. Paul traveled. Um, now, some places they're very, they were in, really ingrained in, uh, in uh, middle platonic cults. In uh, there was a, uh, there was a, the letter to the Colossians, now that's disputed. It's not really certain that, that St. Paul wrote it. It was written by one of his, his devotees. But uh, nevertheless, in Colossae, there, there was a very active cult of Hecate, an active cult of Apollo. There was this idea of ascent mysticism and, you know, kind of shamanistic practices and Middle Platonism all coming together in this region, uh, which is very interesting. You know, so I've followed the, the, the route, the, the, um, the walking route and the wagon route uh, between, you know, Antioch and Ephesus and then going the top way the, via Colosseum which is the more popular routes. Um, so that there is a lot of things where people came, particularly to do with things like games, you know, because temples had games and every four years there'd be uh, a, a big games at, say, for example, at Didyma and then, or at, or at Daphne. Um, and and the, uh, people come from all over the Greek speaking world and beyond to experience this, this ex, you know, this fantastic event. Um, and these are kind of times when people can sit and talk and discuss what's new, you know, what's the latest, uh, you know, latest cult ideas. Um, you know, people in Syria at that time, they were keen on making their gods into Romanized gods. And when that happened, they changed a little bit. Um, 
you know, certainly the Hecate that we, we know in the Chaldean oracles, uh, that aspect of Hecate has definitely been subject to Roman influence. So you, we can see that that's not a kind of typical ancient Greek going back to Hesiod. It, it's it's something of a of a later development. There's a time when Hecate becomes associated with the moon. Um, and John Philoponos, he writes on, on this that Hecate will not speak when she's facing Mars. And this obviously it's referring to a, an astrological conjunction where uh, in those days they had whole house signs. So any anything where there's Mars in the way and Hecate will not speak. So whatever oracle you go to, you can sit in your trance as much as you like, but it won't be Hecate that's speaking. Um, so that's, that's quite a, a curious thing. But uh, in this period, um, it's been thought that um, uh, Hecate, she kind of took on lunar aspects. And there's an oracle that Porphyry cites, uh, and it's been often thought to be a Chaldean oracle, but it's not. Um, um, it seems to have come from probably Didyma in, in Western Asia Minor. And uh, what we had in Didyma, we had a, a famous Apollo temple, and it also, there was a Hecate cult at that same temple. So there's a, an interesting parallel there. And there was a sacred way between Miletus, uh, city gates and the, the temple. I've actually there. walked that. I've actually been there and walked that. I know that. Have you? Oh, well, well I, I, I so much want to do this because it, oh, it's, it's, it was... I'll tell you, Miletus and Didyma and a lot of the places on the uh, the Turkish side of the Aegean mm. are, are wonderful. As an archaeological mm -hmm. archaeological site, they are incredible. Uh, sorry, I butted in there. Sorry, no, about but I, I, it's my, my plan to sort of make a make a trip at some point to, to oh, see these love places. It. You would love because it. I think I think that there is. Um, I mean, I've been to Lagina and the Temple of Hecate there, and I was part of a a, a big event that that happened in. I think 2005 at the Temple of Lagina, uh, 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 but um, you know, there's some of these other places where there, there was a sacred way, and um, these ideas of uh, processional routes and things, mm. they they appear in in many of the uh, many of the ancient sources. But one of the things that is regarded as as is this a Chaldean oracle or is it not? It refers to Hecate as Phoebe, uh, uh, which is basically her own grandmother. So she appears as her own grandmother. And she also appears as Aletheia, who is the goddess of childbirth. So uh, she appears in, in, in three different guises, but it's definitely making her into this sort of lunar aspect, um, which is not always in the in the earlier sources. You know what's and fascinating to... here? Something I'd never thought of before was the point you're making here about cross fertilization, the way in which, you know, a sort of a deity would change. And because of mm -hmm. the communications and the different cultures and the, the mismatch of the crossroads and the trade routes, I'd never really thought about it like that before. And I think that's why I'm finding this absolutely fascinating, because this is an area I've always been very interested in. And I'm re reading at the moment the writings of a uh, uh, an American theologian, I think it's Paul Erhart, I think. Um, and he's explaining in the book I'm reading about the way in which you can't really, the words that were used and written down, and I never thought about this before, and it's totally my stupidity, but the idea, of course, everything was copied. So mm -hmm. the scribes that would copy and each right. would be a copy of something else, which people would put their own little bits into. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, an interesting thing that that Porphyry says in his own work, you know, where he he, he says that uh, if I come across something that doesn't read well, or it's, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but if it's clunky or messy or it doesn't read right, I will change it and make it better. And he says that now, if he's taking the Chaldean oracles to the you know, Neoplatonic world and saying, look, look at this cool stuff, no doubt that he's done done something with it to make it more readable yeah himself he does the same with Plotinus's work because he sections in and, and it has to be him because he edited Plotinus's work Plotinus wrote so poorly that he could barely understand it himself reading it back and others reading it for the first time thought what the heck's going on so um but Porphyry seems to section in one of the Chaldean oracles into uh, one area, just one part of 
of Plotinus's Enneads. And, and that's caused this huge thing in scholarship of, well, maybe he was interested in the Chaldean oracles, maybe he studied the Chaldean oracles. Plotinus was not in the least bit interested in the Chaldean oracles, but I think Porphyry was a bit sly. And I think what he's done is that he's thought, if I put this bit from the Chaldean oracles into Plotinus's work, then it will add authority to these oracles that I'm trying to introduce to the Neoplatonic uh, uh, philosophers. It will add extra weight. And people were all about adding extra weight to their own thoughts. And that's the same reason why people quote the Bible or Shakespeare to add extra weight to their mm. own consciousness, to add extra you know, gravitas to the thing they're trying to say. So, um, you know, I've looked at it and thought, well, what, what happens next? You know, and, it, and I've looked at it and I thought, hang on a minute. This is talking about it's not talking about ascent in Plotinus. It's talking about the after death state. And you're so reading, a, and you're reading this in 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 uh, ancient Greek, Middle Greek, aren't you? I, I'm reading it in 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 ancient Greek, yes. Yes, which is but, but I'm looking guys at guys out there. You don't realise this that Susan is reading this stuff in its original form, which is profoundly important. You know, she's not reading it translated into English. She's reading it in the Greek. I just thought I'd let you let everybody be aware of that uh, I mean, because you have to because mm. modern translators they play fast and loose and say well oh, that's a much better word or that's much because even when you're reading the bible which uh, i've you know i've read in the greek and i've read the uh, the uh, uh, the old testament uh, as uh, you know as we call it in the hebrew looking at the the differences that you think well actually that word could mean so and so and this word could mean something else and this word could could suggest a completely different thing that there, there is so much gnosticism in saint paul's writings it's incredible gnostic ideas gnostic concepts that must have been part of everyday you know everyday speech um that you can kind of take it apart and, and read it with a Gnostic eye. Uh, I know certainly people have done this with the Gospel of John, that they're starting to look at that in a more Gnostic way. But um, certainly when you read it in, in, the, in the Greek, you can see, hang on a minute, this is really something quite powerful. But in the English, it's not. Mm. And what the translators make it out to, they don't want the, they don't want the steward's inquiry, you know, the, uh, at the editor's desk so you know like, let's just you know kind of you know keep keep it okay but i mean i wish that people would start to be a little bit more adventurous in the in the translations because um especially when you're coming from the point of view of knowing about you know gnostic material altered states of consciousness uh different periods uh different belief structures that you can see that that uh, all of this is there you know, there's such a lot that's there that that um, it has to be taken apart. And me, me and my late friend Francis, Francis Cameron, we, between us, we had a, a small group in Oxford, uh, not the group where I, I was looking at, um, uh, um, God, I've forgotten the name, of the name of the book I looked at, but uh, me and Francis, we had the uh, the Heretics Club because it was basically working through the Greek and and kind of with a with a with a magician's eye or a mystic's eye, mm -hmm. and thinking oh oh, <laughs> because there's a lot in the Bible that would make you go oh uh, if you were to, uh, but also uh, that's from the Greek the Greek text, but from the Hebrew as well. There's so much in the Hebrew that is um, you know kind of glossed over, and um, uh, that if you know about later Jewish mysticism, uh, such as the Hekelot sources and Merkava sources and then Kabbalah. Um, now, we can't really, really say we've got Kabbalistic ideas in the Bible, in, in the Torah and so forth. This is something that is very bad to say in scholarship, you know, because it's like we're looking at a me medieval text, we're looking at medieval scholarship and ideas that came about through, through a trade route, through a, a gradual development. But a lot of these developments in the Old Testament, they happened in Babylonia. Uh, so we, it, 
not in ancient times, not during Babylonian exile, but from, you know, the 6th century onwards through to the 10th century. Um, and, and we see a certain uh, uh, midrashim, we see uh, certain ideas that are part of the later text, the commentaries. And we see a similar thing in, in the Chaldean oracles with people who are taking the base text and then adding to it to expand upon it, to add more to it. And they're doing the exact same thing as, as medieval rabbis looking at uh, uh, the, you know, looking at the Torah and then and then taking it to the next level and having discussions uh, uh, across time with other rabbis who are talking about it and putting their own spin on it and their own ideas on it, but all within the uh, the rules of of Hebraic scholarship, you know, from you know from the uh, the yeshivas and so forth, where these things would have been discussed in great depth. Um, one of the important things in in uh, Jewish scholarship is this idea of continuing to to update and to refresh and to and to argue as well. Whereas this is one thing that's not done in the Christian sources. This is an issue with the Christian sources that it's like, well, if it's in the Bible, it's set and we can't discuss or debate it. The same with Islam. Um, whereas with the Jewish material, there is this continuity of let's let's interpret this to our own day. Let's make, keep it current to our own day. And, um, and then you start to see uh, flourishes of, of mysticism and really high mysticism. And, and through my knowledge of, of, of Kabbalah, for example, particularly Zoharic Kabbalah, uh, looking at uh, Gnostic texts from uh, the second, third century, you can see the kernel of what arrives in the Zohar uh, in, in about 1244. You know, you think, oh, hang on a minute, I can see the, the root of this. Um, now, that is another possibility. Um, part of my original research did have a, a, a Jewish mystical element, but uh, my supervisors didn't know sufficient you know, about, about that tradition to be able to confidently, you know, sort of su supervise that. Um, so I was convinced to sort of stick within the Greco, you know, kind of Syrian sort of world. Um, and it broke my heart because I'd, I'd done so much already on the Hekelot sources and the Merkava sources and, and the uh, apocalyptic sources, really analysing all of these. You know, these, Susan, these it's, really, it's, really, I'm, it's really quite frustrating for me here. Had I known your absolute depth of knowledge on this, the macabre features in one of my previous books. Um, and a lot of Jewish mysticism appears in my books. And you could have really put meat on the bone for me. In terms of <laughs> most unfortunate. I mean, uh, it really would have helped me a lot because a lot of it is so, you know, you've got to you've got to know the background to it. It's coding as well. That's one issue that appears in the Jewish sources, particularly in Kabbalah, where, you know, uh, even things like what and who. Mm. They're not what or who, but these are other things that, you know, like what is Shekinah and who is Bina. And, uh, and we see the, uh, these uh, references to, to uh, spaces on the tree of life and experiences that go with them. So um, even the numbers and things like that, so, like in the beginning of, uh, of Genesis, where uh, we see um, Bereshit, uh, the, the first word in the beginning, but b means two, so it means you know two in the beginning. So in the beginning there were two entities, yeah. and that's how Kabbalists would understand it. So we better sheet, and you're thinking, right, okay, so this is really significant that we have to look at it from not just one entity but two entities. Um, which, of course, uh, many um, Jewish scholars would go, ah, oh, no, you can't. No, no, don't mess with it. But this is what uh, Kabbalists were doing. They were taking the, the text and they were taking it apart and they were moving letters around. Um, and things such as gematria that came in later, uh, this is a very powerful uh, uh, technique. And I think such as uh, uh, letter codes and so forth, these were all really valued tools. Um, so 
you know, think that it's important to understand it. And that's why my supervisors weren't able to get involved in that because there were there's there's so much code in in text such as the, the, the Zohar. guy the guy that you should have worked with probably do you know Les Lancaster? I contacted Les Lancaster because someone else advised me and mm -hmm. he said he, he, his knowledge wasn't that to do with that area. But oh. um, I'll tell you who, who uh, was would have been dead keen on board. I was in contact with a man called Eitan Fishbane, uh, a, a Jewish scholar of Zoharic narrative. And um, he was really keen to come on board as a, as a, as a, an external advisor. Um, but the, the team at Lampeter, they weren't keen on external people that they didn't know and things like that. Uh, I, I was also in, in touch with Professor Daniel Matt, who, who would, who would, who would uh, translated the Zohar. Um, or a, a good, a good, uh, good amount of it for the Pritzker edition. So uh, I've been in touch with both those people and several others as well, who were very, very keen on my research, because it, it, they could understand that there was a, a movement of ideas that may have started in Neoplatonism or Middle Platonism that had moved through and been accepted through the Babylonian sort of. Because once once Christianity came in and threw people out of Athens, people went went into uh, the Near East, they went to Haran, they went to uh, Babylonia, uh, people travelled uh, away, you know, and also uh, Jewish people did as well. So we had massive yeshivas uh, in uh, in Babylonia, uh, two very famous ones. Um, and then, of course, because of Islam, they moved and ended up in um, uh, in um, Tunisia now. What's now Tunisia? And then again, because of Islam, they ended up in in Spain. So these ideas have moved through from um, you know maybe you know, ancient Israel to Babylonia, to Syria, to all of these different locations. That's where, that's where the Cordoba school came from and everything else, I guess. Mm, they were being, yeah. I'd never, so, really, never really realised that the diaspora was quite, you know... Massive, yeah. incredibly massive. And in Cordoba, you see uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, Sufi schools mm. on the same street as the Kabbalah schools, and yeah. they were running side by side. So the free flow of ideas that what, what, what must have happened during general conversation at the marketplace, yeah. you know, people sitting on, you know, sitting on the, you know, the steps and things, you know, just having a chat with their neighbours. Can you imagine, you know, a conversation between on a, in the hot streets of Cordoba, which is one of my favourite places in the world, and the hot streets, the Sufis debating and swapping ideas with the Kabbalists, you know, is just an mm -hmm. extraordinary intellectual ferment, you know, um, incredible. I'm aware, I'm aware, Susan, that in terms of time, we've, we've only got about 20, 25 minutes, and I, I'd be happy to go on for hours on this. But I know you also want to talk about the work you've been doing on Eileen Garrett and, and her life. So, and I really don't want to miss out on that because you were always very, you were always very tantalizing when you were mentioning before we started about her work as well. So well, I, I, I was invited to write a, a, a piece, piece of back matter for a, a new book that's coming out. Book and and what had happened and edited, is that, am I right? It's edited by uh, Greg Shushan. That's right. Yes. Who was the previous and, guest of this show? So, so uh, Greg contacted me, and he, he he said, "Would I be, you know, open to doing, you know, to kind of reviewing, reading the book, and writing a, a piece about it for the book to go on the back, or on, uh, or in the middle, or somewhere, you know?" So I said, "Yes, okay." And he sent me the book, and I started to read it. And I mean, she goes at a mile a minute to start with. And what can this is... Explain, can you just very quickly explain who she was for the people who want right, to... Right, okay. Eileen Garrett was a very famous medium who uh, was, was Irish and... Uh, she did a variety of mediumistic styles. Um, I knew of her uh, initially, and I do put this in, in the piece, uh, whether, whether Greg will leave it in or not, but... I was working at the Arthur Finley College and I finished my lecture and I snuck into the, uh, the a lecture that was overrunning by one of my colleagues. And, and um, 
so I, I went and I listened to the end of her talk and then during the questions and answers, there was a man who said, you know, is, are there any books that you recommend, any authors, any of the pioneers, you know, this is a big word for spiritualists, is pioneers or for mediums, uh, that you would recommend that somebody starting out should read. And uh, strangely enough, the lady said, Eileen Garrett, now, um, the woman who was giving the talk was uh, a, a very, uh, she couldn't see anything. She wasn't clair clairvoyant, but she was clairaudient to a very high degree. And, and she said that uh, Eileen was also clairaudient to a, to a high degree and that you know, she was a fascinating woman. So when I came home from, from, uh, from that, that week working there, I found a first edition of um, my life in a search for medium, meaning, meaning in mediumship or something. So I bought, I bought the book and um, it was quite an interesting read. And it, it explains about her early life and some of the things that happened to her. Now, in her early life, um, she was three days old and her mother uh, committed suicide. Uh, she drowned herself. Now, it's unknown whether she actually did drown herself or whether she had some sort of seizure in the bath or something, which is possible. But it, it's really un, unknown. And, but she grew up believing that her mother had killed herself. And then uh, some weeks after that, her father did the same. He shot himself. Um, so she then had to go and live with her, her auntie and her uncle, who, who hated her. And she was, she was brought up in this sort of very sterile Irish ha household uh, of, of Irish Protestants. And um, Eileen was fascinated by the Catholic mass and you know, she had to go to a Catholic school and, and she would listen to, you know, the, the mass you know, and, the, and the bells and cells and all. But of course, no, you can't go. You can't go there. No, that's evil. You're evil if you want to go to this. Um, uh, so she was constantly being told that she was a little devil or, or, you know, spawn of the devil or spawn of Satan and things. And then in later life, well, this book is discovered because when she dies uh, in 1970, her daughter and granddaughter inherit loads of boxes, you know, just boxes of notes and letters and things that she's written and scribbled down. And she was a prolific writer, was Eileen Garrett, but um, not so much, she was interested in science and she was interested in psychic phenomena and she was always putting herself forward to be, to be researched. You know, any, anyone in, in America, you know, you're gonna pay my airfare, I'll come and, you know, get, get strapped up to this and answer your questions and turn over Zeno cards, you know, I'll do all of that. So she, she was very well, well known trying to make mediumship more scientific. And she kept this diamond, this spirit guide, secret all her life, that it only came to light after she had died, that, that she was outside Harrods, looking at things she couldn't afford. And then this handsome stranger appeared to her and advised her not to waste her time or on her, uh, her time and money on things that she couldn't afford. And she thought, oh, okay, he's nice looking. And it was this gorgeous man and kept appearing to her and telling her things. And then over the course of time, uh, she asked him, asked him his name and, she, and he said, you can call me Lucifer. So, uh, again, a huge question mark over, well, where, where have you kind of got this from? You know, because very often when you get a name of a guide, it's usually got some, you know, some basis in something, you know. Um, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's a communicator who gives you a name and you think, right, fair enough. But it, it seemed to me that it was something very strange because one of her very good friends is um, uh, uh, G.R.S. Mead. And G.R.S. Mead was a theosophist and he was the one-time editor or co-editor of a theosophy magazine called Lucifer. Yes. And, and she was a really good chum of this man. So I started to wonder, and I didn't write this in my piece, but I started to wonder, is this diamond, is this entity, the, the spirit of the magazine, 
is it the is it the egregore of the magazine who has taken on some sort of form and um, because uh, uh eileen was so uh you know kind of in a mode with the knowledge of of uh, of mead and what he brought to the table i mean mead translated the Chaldean oracles in 1908 um you know, it was it was a, a massive Gnostic and and he, he kind of fell away from theosophy because of a, a scandal where uh, one of the uh, you know, one of the high one of the high ups, uh, uh, W.C. Leadbeater, uh, being caught out, uh, uh, you know, kind of molesting a, a young boy. Um, and, and so this was a, a, an issue where a lot of theosophists resigned their membership because of this debacle. Uh, and he was one of them. And he set up his own organisation called the, the Quest Society. And they met once a month in London. And Mead brought from Cambridge and Oxford and all of the top academics of the day. And this went on until 1939. Uh, he, he brought people to talk about mysticism, magic, theosophy, the ancient world, uh, 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 comparative religion, art, all of these people who were scholars and they'd never heard someone who was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn talk about what it's like to be in a ritual. And some of this information started to feed back into the early scholarship that started to evolve through groups such as this. So, um, and through Mead and other people, she became good friends with it doesn't say in the book, but I knew when I saw certain names where it says, ah, she was a good friend of W.B. Yeats, who's a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, practicing magician. Oh, Maud Gone, another member of the Hermetic Order, uh, uh, Order of the Golden Dawn, good friends. So her knowledge of things, because as I'm reading it, I'm thinking that's middle platonic. That's Gnostic. That's uh, that's from the Upanishads, and you can see certain things where there are crossovers of ideas that may not have been Eileen's own ideas, because uh, and you can read it very quickly. It's a it's a page turner, but you can't read it really fast. You've got to go. Hang on a minute. This is telling me, and it's it's in layers. So this is a very significant thing about the book is that it's written in layers and that as you peel back those layers, you start to understand what's being discussed. But somebody who's maybe a, a spiritualist who has heard about Eileen Garrett, they buy the book. They're just going to go, race, 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 race. Well, that was that. And it took a week because you could read it in a week or two weeks or something very easily. But. If you have the background knowledge of Hermeticism, of Middle Platonism, Neoplatonism, the ideas that have been expressed in, in there, even ideas about who Lucifer is as well, because, uh, you know, is Lucifer the light bringer? Is it the Christian devil? Is it, you know, some archetype? Is it, what is it? What, what is it that's talking to you? Because obviously it has a physical presence. It talks to you in great depth about, about philosophical things um, and seems to help you with your work. And she kept this entity completely private and secret to herself until her relatives discovered this box of stuff with the correspondences and discussions between herself and this entity that had gone on for years. You know, this, of course, the you know, you know, from my concept of the Damon and the Adelon, and I've long argued that um, a lot of top mediums, they they are facilitated by and guided by a higher presence, which is their own higher self, which I'd call the Damon. And I wasn't aware of this with Eileen Garrett because I'm re immediately reminded of Rosalind Haywood and um, the way in which she felt that she was a, a, a double personality and there was another version of her that was very different to her, which was much more impish and dangerous. And I know that she mentions in her autobiography something similar. So this clearly is a book that's well... It, it, again, it's, it's, it's so important, isn't it, that when these books are read and you need somebody like you who's got that kind of breadth and depth of experience to really interpret what is being said, 
you know, because both the two themes we've had here of, you know, the, the, cult, the, the, the Chaldean oracles and the way in which you've been able to bring your experiences as a clairvoyant medium to interpret from the point of view of an experiencer, as well as somebody who clearly has invested a vast amount of time in learning the languages that they're written in. But you also speak the language of Eileen Garrett because you've mm. come through that route yourself as well. So it makes yeah. you a profoundly important person in the whole development of these ideas, in my humble opinion. Sir, I don't know. Well, what I, I think it's, it's very useful. I mean, if, uh, you know, if, if someone had have kind of done a, a commentary to the material underneath or something, because there's one, one bit where she goes on a real, for pages and pages about the Eleusinian mysteries. Oh my God. Wow. She goes on and on about the Eleusinian mysteries. And she, uh, because she's a, 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 a very interesting woman, she's a very free thinker. She talks about voodoo loire and possession cults in, in Haiti. She talks about nameless sex with people. She doesn't want to know who their names are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is all going on. I mean, she's, she's buried three husbands and seems not to be bothered too much by, by any of that. And, and um, but she's she's also fascinated by the Eleusinian mysteries, and she writes this extremely lurid account. None of it stands up to scholarship of what actually did happen at the Eleusinian mysteries. And she's saying about sex orgies and human sacrifice, and it's all bunkum, absolute bunkum. Um, but, you know, I had to sort of explain that and say, you know, like all, like all, uh, uh, you know, like all devils, sometimes they, sometimes they lie. <laughs> or, um, but I, I understood this because I thought, hang on a minute, because if she's, because at that time she was living in London, uh, at one point she was living in London, when she's meeting the various people who were members of the, uh, of the Golden Dawn and, you know, the, the early groups that kind of came from that. Um, you know, Waite had his own group, which is a bit more Christianized, um, and uh, various other uh, little groups that developed. And they all hung around the Theosophical Society, picking up members. So they all were interspersed with each other. But uh, in 1910, Alistair Crowley and uh, Leila Waddell, they enacted the, the rights of Eleusis at the Caxton Hall as a public event. Wow, did so, they? So I, I imagined at, at sort of polite conversations around the dinner table that there would have been discussions amongst the, you know, the great and the good of what do you think actually happened? What do you think went on? And of course, that will have filtered through in her, maybe in her imagination. And it's been spat out again as some kind of spiritual correspondence of the real truth of the Eleusinia, uh, which, of course, is, is rubbish. <laughs> but... Um, and, and having read the text of, of, of Crowley's Eleusinian Rite, um, it's, uh, it's not that gory, but he does talk about fields of blood, but it, it's not that gory at all. So uh, I think that the, the development of these ideas of what must have been going on at the Eleusinia, uh, that's kind of come through, you know, kind of people standing around at, at dinner parties and, you know, kind of cocktail parties, and because she did like that sort of life. She, uh, you know, she she likes to meet people and you know be be, uh, be appreciated. So I think that some of this is fantasy, some of it is communication, and that you've got to pull it apart to see what's what. Um, you know, I've always had this strong belief that all mediums. I mean, every medium I've ever met has had childhood experiences of extreme trauma. Uh, whether it's being bullied, whether it's losing a parent or a relative, uh, all of these things. And, you know, and I started to look at the development of um, uh, dissociative identity disorder, uh, not in an extreme form where you can't function, but where there's an aspect of yourself that, for want of a better word, you might call it a, a, a kind of split off or a shamanic aspect of self that's gone off and developed in its own path away from the trauma, away from the problem, and then reconnected with the person in later life. And then it's actually yourself. It's your own lost part. Um, and I, and I, I'm con you know, kind of constantly picking apart these ideas that the, the spirit guide in people who are highly mediumistic, especially from, ch from childhood, um, 
there's always trauma there. And uh, when you get a, a trauma in later life, um, such as teenage years and so forth, it, it, it can become mediumship and or substance abuse or both at the same time. Uh, such with the Fox sisters in 1847, yeah. where, you know, they, they were all alcoholics. Uh, 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 Eileen Duncan, uh, um, uh, Helen Duncan, sorry, uh, also a very well-known alcoholic. Uh, uh, so you, you, you get this idea of uh, uh, substances, can't stand, you know, the reality of this world, have to escape to another. And the other world, it can sometimes be the world of the spirits or it can be the world of, 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 you know, substances and so forth. If you get someone who is perhaps a soldier who has had a bad experience in Afghanistan or Iraq or something like that, he very rarely becomes a medium. Very rarely. It's so, I've never heard of it. I've heard of it in people who have had childhood trauma, people who have had teenage trauma, but never battle trauma mm -hmm. those things don't go together absolutely amazing uh, observation i love that i think that's so interesting and and just before you were talking about disassociative identity disorder i was thinking the exactly the same thing like i think that um that's such a fascinating observation and i think it's very easy because when people do have these skills they're often surrounded by people who are desperate for information from them and, and kind of buoy up their confidence in their psychic ability and your um your integrity with picking apart what you think is likely to be true and what doesn't intuitively feel right to you or is, is likely fantasy and imagination is really discerning and amazing. So, yeah. yeah. But I think it's important. I mean, Morton Class has written on this in, in relation to anthropology and uh, looking at uh, uh, trance and possession practices in anthropology. And, and, I, and I think that his work is very useful. Uh, and it, it was written after he, uh, it was published after he died. But uh, it, it, it takes apart things like dissociative identity disorder and then several other things, which in the field of, uh, if you're not a psychiatrist or psychologist, you're not really free to write about these things in such an open way. But things such as uh, DID, you can. You can involve yourself in that, in the sense of uh, anthropological research of what's going on. Um, things where you've got out of body experiences. Th this is another factor. Uh, and uh, Etzel Cardenia, you know, in his varieties of anomalous experience, he goes very deeply into taking apart the experiences of mediums and psychics and people who have uh, um, UFO experiences. You know, what is going on from a psychological perspective? What else could it be that's not the, you know, the mystical thing, that's not the psychic thing? That's not really aliens. That um, you know, let's look at it from a you know, from a more round sort of perspective. And I'm all for that because you know I'm not one of these people. If you said to me, oh, "I remember a past life in Atlantis," I think, "Oh my God!" You know, okay, well, you know, nice, but I don't believe it. You know, there, there's certain things that I really pull the you know pull the drawbridge down down towards. Um, you know, I won't be rude to the person, but I, I won't. You know, I won't engage with it because I, I think that, you know, some of that is, I mean, I've had people talk about past life experiences. I had one woman and she once said to me that uh, she'd been the main character in, in Anna Karenina and the and, and when the author had actually written it about her. Uh, I thought, no, that's that, that's just you having read Anna, Anna Karenina, maybe, you know, in your, in your teenage years, forgotten all about it and then reread it again, recognised, you know, I think there's all sorts of things like that going on. Um, Isn't it amazing what people are capable of forgetting? And I always think that, you know, you're a historian and a researcher of ancient cultures, and I think that's, you know, ancient culture and ancient history is really the collective memory of the world and humanity. So if you're well versed in that, then I think it does make you quite discerning when it comes mm. to interpreting people's ideas about the reality that they've experienced. And I think you're right, people very, very willing to discount their previous experience and underestimate what they have experienced so far. Like, so like you say, like things like books, films, TV shows, even adverts that we watched as a kid can have massive impacts on our consciousness and memory.
Well, as they say, you know, the argument past lives, you know, can be put down on many cases to cryptomnesia. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to come to that conclusion. I think Susan, you and I have discussed this many times, you know, the whole concept of past lives. You know, it could be argued that, you know, to, to use a, a populist term, you know, it's it's accessing the the Akashic record or what I, or what I would call the Jungian collective unconscious or the the the, the mind system of the um, the uber daemon within my own model. Um, we're now coming towards the end of the two hours. And I have to say, Susan, that was quite extraordinary. Um, I found that I'd learned so much. I'm now going to be rushing out. I've got a whole. Sounds gone. Sounds gone again, Tony. Oh, oh right. Has it? You're back on. You're back uh, on. I'm back on out. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the archons. They play on it. But what I was saying was that, you know, Susan, that was quite an extraordinary exercise in in it, so many things. I learned so much. And as I say, I've got a list of names of people I want to follow up on, people I knew like Porphyry, but I'd, I'd never really put him in context in any shape or form. Um, so I really need to, to, to bone up on this and, and have a good look at it. Um, but we're coming towards the end now. So, Susan, I, I'm absolutely sure that the response to this will be extraordinary. People will be really fascinated about the things you've said. It has been intellectually rigorous. It has been intellectually fascinating. What can I say? Absolutely an extraordinary two hours. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, can can you let people know how they can? And we didn't even touch upon your, your other skills, you know, which um, in terms of helping people and your extraordinary abilities in terms of clairvoyance, which I know from mutual friends of Sarah and I. And I know that you're, you're <laughs> it's just uncanny. You you can do you. You really are the real deal. You know, there's no question. Um, so how can people contact you? Uh, what's your website? All your contact details, everything else, if you can let them know now. You put, put it on. It's very simple. It's www.susanlayborn.com. That's my website. And on the back of that, there's a contact page where there's my phone number, my mobile number uh, and my email address. Uh, um what I'm hoping to do, what I'm trying to do, uh, I mean, what I do with Amanda is, is it's more, um, you know, kind of guidance in in response to like like spiritual development, uh, Gnostic involvement, the ancient world, um, different ideas of, of development. And how I explained it to, to one person was um, helping you understand uh, what your soul is trying to express and to bring it out um you know so i think that that's something that i'm 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 developing more of is working with people um on a one to one you know on the phone or on on zoom to uh, to really work with their their higher self to to work with their development not necessarily psychic development or mediumistic development even though people do do come to me for that but their their soul gnosis, you know how to how to understand just the to, enormity just, just of their to soul. Put this into context, by the way, if anybody's interested here, um, Amanda Radcliffe, who was a previous guest of this, it was Susan's guidance that sent Amanda down to the south of France, and Susan was absolutely specific as to who she was going to meet when she was down there, and everything else. Even I'm correct in saying, am I not? even to the say saying that she'd be working with Nicolas Cage. Now, to me, that is absolutely mind-blowingly extraordinary that you were able to predict that Amanda was going to go and she was going to do a film with Nicolas Cage. That You cannot argue with that in any way. It's impossible to argue with that predictive ability, you know, or, or whatever, whatever you source that from. It is just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Because who would have thought a girl from the Wirral was going to go down to the south of France and do a movie with Nicolas Cage? Well, of course, statistically, <laughs> you might have just guessed it, you know. It um, happens to everyone, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, mean, so, I mean, I'm still doing my day-to-day -day readings, you know. I mean, I don't have people to, to my home any longer, but I, I, I have telephone appointments or Zoom appointments. But, uh, you know, I'm working more in a holistic sort of way, working more with the, someone's soul development, people who are interested in developing their, their inner, uh, their, you know, their inner contact to the all that is. 
And because my background is so diverse, that if someone contacts me and they say, I'm interested in Kabbalah, I can work from that perspective. If someone says I'm interested in, you know, kind of Upanishadic mysticism, I can, I can approach it from that perspective. Or if someone says, you know, I'm a developing medium, but I'm struggling, I can work from that perspective as well. So, um, you know, that there's a lot that that I can kind of bring to the table. And, you know, I, and I found, you know, probably through working with Amanda, it's sort of a, a um, an interest in the Gnostic material that that I've I've kind of explored to a very great depth to to kind of bring it into sometimes into my own research, but also to understand what's going on in, in the Gnostic current as well. So um, I'm kind of open to a lot of different things, you know. So uh, if people want to just get in touch and you know uh, ask me stuff and arrange things, I, I'm I'm quite happy to do that. Wonderful. I can also say thank you, thank you very much. And what I think we need to do, sir, at some time in the future is maybe get Amanda and Susan together in a, a kind of a, a show where we could we could really explore some of these aspects in greater detail. And I think that would be simply fascinating. Uh, and Susan, if you were up to that, I'm sure that Amanda would be as well. OK, well, thank you, everybody, for listening in. Um, this will be uploaded onto my YouTube channel uh, later this evening. Um, and I'm just looking forward now to... Sarah and I really getting into some very interesting areas with some very intriguing future guests as well. But my thanks to the extraordinary Susan Laybourne because absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.